All right. Welcome back, everybody. Everybody have that gnocchi? Was that good? That was fantastic. All right. So just before we get started, I'm uh, I'm promoting a, uh, is that up there? The Sick Kids uh, talk? No? Well, I'll let you know about it without a slide. On April 24th, the Sick Kids Center for Mental Health Learning Institute is offering a half-day webinar on reproductive and perinatal mental illness, facilitated by Dr. Gina Wong, an award-winning psychologist and author. The webinar will provide a foundational understanding of evidence-informed practices when working with women's reproductive and perinatal mental health. They have generously offered an exclusive 50% discount towards the registration fee for conference attendees. You can learn more and register by scanning the QR code on the screen. Yeah, what timing. Okay. So um, I'm privileged and honored to be the chair of this next session, a spotlight on perinatal mental health with my heroes and mentors who will be speaking. Um, up first is Dr. Simone Vigod, Professor Temerary Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto, head of the Department of Psychiatry and Senior Scientist and Shirley A. Brown Memorial Chair in Women's Mental Health Research at Women's College Hospital. All right. Okay. Thank you. It is such a pleasure uh, to be here today. And I am, am I close enough to the mic? Yeah. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I am really, really honored uh, to be here and uh, to be able to join in and uh, walking us through sex, gender, reproductive life stages as this relates to uh, mental health. So I'm excited that uh, I get to kick off the period of spotlight on perinatal mental health, which Patricia already uh, foreshadowed uh, for us in the morning. So um, what I thought I would do in my 20 minutes is talk about some work that we are doing in collaboration with CAMH and with some of the other uh, hospitals here, because I thought it would be a good, not funded by CAMH Women Mind, it's funded by uh, the CIHR, but uh, it's a really great collaboration that we're having uh, with CAMH, so I thought that it would be interesting to talk about it. And also because, um, you know, I saw that my colleague uh, Daisy Singla is presenting after me, and I think, you know, Dr. Singla and I both would probably agree, and you can tell me if you don't agree when you come up, that both of us have kind of spent our careers preoccupied with the issues around access to care uh, that we heard about. And I think both of us in sort of different ways are trying to come at the, these issues. So I thought this would be a, hopefully a good, uh, good uh, taste of, of some of that work. Um, some uh, disclosures and acknowledgements and also just listing um, the other investigators uh, on the, the big trial I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna focus today specifically on depression and pregnancy and on some of the decision-making dilemmas that we have around treatment, particularly as these relate to, you know, and reflecting on, you know, what Patricia talked to us about earlier, we have, you know, people who have mild, moderate, and then severe illness. And I think, you know, the, the consequences of untreated, especially severe illness can be really dire. So I'm gonna um, talk a bit about in that end of the spectrum and then talk to you about a trial that we're doing to try and have some new novel uh, options and access to care for this population. So what I did on the next slide is I actually did the math behind what Patricia told you, because my son had a, a test on uh, like radicals this morning. And anyway, so I think the math is okay, but basically, you know, there are about 400,000 births in Canada every year. And if around 20% of uh, pregnant and postpartum people have uh, some kind of mental health issue. We're talking about 80,000 affected perinatal Canadians and their children and their families uh, annually. So this is not a small problem. So even if we move the needle a little bit, we can make huge gains. 
So depression in pregnancy is one of the most common complications uh, of childbirth. So we think that the prevalence of depression in pregnancy is about 10%. Does anyone know what the prevalence of, I don't know, gestational diabetes is? Raise your hand if you think it's more than 10%. Raise your hand if you think it's less than 10%. Keep your hand up if you think the same is true for preeclampsia. Yeah. Okay, like these are the things you think about when you go to the OB, right? And the things that you get normally screened for and they're checking for like at every appointment. This one is, I don't know, five to six times as common as those ones, okay, just for context. We talked quite a bit already today, so I won't belabor the point about consequences, but, you know, I, I titled my talk Treating for Two. Um, it's probably treating for more than two, right? But this is that really interesting time when we're talking about challenges and opportunities to um, not only uh, a mother, but also their a mother, a birthing person, but also their child and their family. So we're talking about that person's function. And, you know, if you don't treat someone's depression in pregnancy, they're more likely going to have postpartum depression and ongoing depression, right? Um, and the impact of that. Um, and then there's the impact on the child. Um, and, you know, Patricia talked about this um, quite a bit, but when we, you know, we did the research um, a number of years ago, we did some research in Ontario and she had put up the stats, but, you know, rates of maternal mortality are low in, in our country and the US and the UK. And so it's probably not surprising that when somebody does die, if there's a high chance it was because of mental illness. The good news, depression and pregnancy is really treatable. So, you know, when you have um, more mild illness, you know, peer support on its own, um, other kinds of um, social support type interventions, when you get into slightly more severe symptoms, really good evidence, as you'll hear later, for psychological treatment, psychotherapies, right? And then, you know, if those don't work, then we do have medications and other, and other treatments, right? Um, and when the non-medication treatments work, that's amazing. That's what we want. Pretty much everybody, what is it, Daisy? Like 95% would like a non-medication treatment first, right? Um, you know, but if they don't work all the time or they're not accessible all the time, then we need to start thinking about other treatments. And the decision becomes more complicated because you get into this situation where there's kind of, you know, there's there's no treatment option, including not having treatment that comes with zero risk. So, you know, we have these first line antidepressant medications. There's no, there haven't really been trials in pregnant people of whether they work, but there's no reason to suspect that they wouldn't work just as well. They can be quite effective and they can work quite quickly. Um, and actually for people who have a history of severe depression, um, prior to pregnancy, in the purple line, this was a trial that came out of uh, Lee Cohen's group many, many years ago in, um, at Mass General. You know, about a quarter of them relapsed if they stayed on medication, but almost 70% relapsed um, if they came off medication. Um, you know, so it's it, for some people, it's like you, re you really need an intervention like this. Um, but then we have to think about the fact that, well, antidepressant medications do, um, they cross the placenta, they go to the baby to some extent, um, they can cross the fetal blood brain barrier. And when we think about medication exposure in pregnancy, like that's when you start thinking about, you know, could this cause a malformation in the baby? Could it cause the baby to have trouble with growth? Um, you know, could it cause the baby to have problems when they're born? And what about like effects for later in childhood? Um, and it's really hard to study um, medications though in pregnancy because um, there have been like a lot, a lot of studies, but in these studies, we're comparing people who took the medications in pregnancy to people who didn't. And those people can actually be really different, right? The people who chose to stay on their medication might have more severe illness or they might have, let's say more other things going on, maybe also alcohol use or maybe more smoking, or right? Like, so you're, you're kind of comparing apples to oranges a little bit, um, even genetics, right? Like if, if, a, if a parent has a, a depressive disorder, then it's gonna be higher risk that their child might have a depressive disorder and other complications. So 
if you don't have a randomized trial where you give one person a medication and one person a, a placebo or, you know, or a Smarty, then how do you, like, how, how do you actually suss this out? So there are some really, you know, advanced ways that we can try and, and our research group has done ways we've compared, you know, siblings of the same mom where in one pregnancy, they took the medication in one pregnancy, they didn't, that helps you control for genetics. Um, we've done these sort of fancy models where we try and make the, where we try and find the people who look like the ones who took medication and so sort of compare them. And, you know, all in all, pretty much we can say that, you know, these first line antidepressant medications are low risk, but in a pregnancy, you can't ever say something zero risk for sure, because there's always a baseline risk of, of complications. And so that makes it Re and it's inconsistent and you know like you read the newspaper and of course if there's a study that comes out that says there's a problem that's going to be talked about like 25 times more than you know if there isn't a problem so you know it's really you you really end up with this kind of complex problem and you know where sometimes the provider even can't really say well for sure it's going to be better for you if you take this medication you know or you don't sometimes it's more clear if someone's like been really really ill but you know, sometimes it's less clear. And ultimately, a pregnant person themselves has to decide whether they're going to take medication. And so that's where we get into this sort of preoccupation that, that I have with the fact that like, many, many people go off their medication. And many, many people like really don't see antidepressants as an effective option. So if the therapy, like didn't work for you, and you, you really feel strongly you don't want to take medication, then you're going to end up with this untreated or undertreated illness that, that we know also has a negative effect. So all that is to say that we're doing what I think is a really neat collaboration with CAMH's um, Temerity Center for Neurostimulation, where they have these non-invasive stimulations of the brain, of the areas of the brain that target depression, to try and figure out, you know, if we do this with pregnant people, can we actually... Um, remit the depression in pregnancy and prevent postpartum depression without anything that's going to go to the baby. Um, and so transcranial direct current stimulation is a really interesting treatment where you, where you give like a small stimulation just over the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is um, one of the areas of the brain that's involved in depression. It's been studied um, in, and, and the person is like awake, alert, um, you know, they're just, they're just sitting there. It's actually been studied since the 1960s when it's aimed at the motor cortex, it's been used to help people with stroke rehabilitation. Um, and there over the years, there've been several positive controlled studies in depression. I'm not going to go into the mechanism, but essentially the idea with these neurostimulation treatments is that by enhancing plasticity and, and um, getting a better balance between cortical excitability um, and decreased cortical excitability that the brain will actually change based on the experience. So you can give the treatment for like three weeks of treatment, but then the, the effects will continue to last. There are several really neat reasons why in pregnancy it would be really great. So first of all, since the 1960s, we've got all these trials that show it, even brain imaging trials that show it only affects that area of the brain. It doesn't change people's heart rate, blood pressure, um, body temperature. It, you don't need anesthesia. There's no magnetic field. And it is this teeny tiny device um, where you can do this at home. This is an animation, um, but then, like this is literally, you want it? It, it also, by the way, there's there's also some evidence for it in um, cognitive improvement. So we can start talking about it in menopause too. Um, um, but this is this is an animation of what it looks like. Like it's a tiny device. You, you like you put the thing on, um, and you can do it. At, you you can do an at home uh, supervised protocol. So in 2019, we did a pilot trial um, with us at Women's and with Mount Sinai, which is one of the other uh, university hospitals here where we had um, 20 participants and you can program the machines to give you the active treatment or a sham treatment that kind of turns it on, it buzzes for a little bit. And then I've done both. You, like you, you can't really tell. Um, and because in the active, it, you get used to it a little bit over time. Um, these were, you know, the people who agreed to participate in that trial, like 80% of them had two prior episodes of depression. So these were people who had a lot of experience with depression. Uh, a baseline Madras and Montgomery, a depression rating scale of 25 is like nearing close to the severe end. Like it's 
might be technically still moderate range, but like moderate to severe range. And we randomized them to the TDCS or to the control. Um, we had them five days a week come in over three weeks. Um, and we did this one in hospital. We actually had an, an obstetrical nurse give the treatment um, and we did fetal monitoring with them um, so that we could generate some safety data. Um, and this is just, this is from our paper, but just so you can see like some of the, you can all see there's other things, right? The, you know, like you, the quotes, like people were just like, oh my goodness, I wouldn't have had another treatment, but I'd be willing to do this. And we were able to monitor um, because even though we only had 20 people, right, we had, they had, you know, 15 sessions each. So we were able to monitor all these sessions, um, really no, minimal side effects. We were able to get continuous fetal monitoring for people who were far enough along in pregnancy. You can't do that until someone's about in the maybe 23-ish weeks, 24 weeks. Um, but it, we, we kind of confirmed that thing where like, nothing happened when they turned it on, right? The, everything just kind of continued along. Um, there was a, a preterm birth that, that's that's about two days preterm and you know preterm birth is quite common in depression anyway and all the infant outcomes were at normal limits. What was really neat was this is a pilot, um, but the depression scores right when they ended treatment were trending lower in the TDCS group. And then this is really interesting. And remember what I told you about neuroplasticity, how like the brain continues to change. So that post-treatment over there on the left, like that's remission rates post-treatment, which look a little low, but remember these are people with quite severe illness. But then four weeks postpartum. So this could be like a couple of months later, they delivered, they had whatever happens to their brain with all the hormonal shifts. So we'd be expecting, we'd be worried about relapse. We'd be worried about worsening. You know, if somebody has untreated depression in pregnancy, normally 93% of the time they will continue to have depression postpartum. Whoa, we actually saw a 75% um, remission rate in the people who had the TDCS at four weeks postpartum um, versus only 30% in the controls, which if this is true and if this bears out in the big trial, like the question is, did it actually protect did the treatment enhance neuroplasticity in a way that actually protected them from then getting the depression uh, postpartum, which could be really huge if that pans out to be true. It was actually statistically significant um, even in the pilot. And by four weeks postpartum, nobody had started antidepressant medication. So this isn't because we, we gave people uh, medication. So what we're doing right now is we actually got funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to now do a much larger sample and to definitively evaluate it for safety and efficacy. And we're using an at-home uh, protocol with video support from the study team. So we only make participants come in once and they come in for their training session and they, um, and, and they, uh, they come in for their training session and they have to like show us all the ways that they know how to do it and everything. And then if everything's okay, they get to take it home um, and they courier it back afterward. And our, staff go on with them every day for three weeks only during the week you get the weekends off we try to complete the protocol of 15 sessions within a month and then when they log in if the staff watches them make sure they put it on properly and everything and then they'll give them the code for that day so it's not like they're they can just you know it's it's supervised in that manner um and then you know but like if you had to go to the bathroom you can turn it off for a second like it's you know and they do a we also give everybody in the sham and the active group um, a depression and pregnancy workbook to give them at least the baseline um, kind of self self management, um, you know, because we expect in this group, like if you're seeing, you know, a, a research coordinator for 15 days for an hour with your depression self management group, like you're going to get better, even if you got placebo, right? Um, so that's why you really need randomized trials for things like this, because if that's all we need, then, and we don't actually need the treatment, we, we want to know that, right? So this is what we tell people. We explain it's a non-drug treatment for depression. That's a small, easy to, easy to use device. You'll be able to do it at home. Like this is essentially what's on our website. And um, then we follow you for the rest of your pregnancy all the way to one year postpartum. Um, so we're really getting follow-ups for the participants and for their kids and their kids' outcomes, right? The, so we look at um, not just the pregnancy complications and outcomes right when they're born, but we actually do... Um, like developmental uh, assessments um, to one year postpartum. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, adults, we, we don't enroll people until they're getting into their second trimester, um, mostly because actually people might not know the first trimester miscarriage rates are like 30%. And so our, our data safety monitoring board said, you know what, like it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense to, to do that until people are into that second trimester. And then the reason we have a top end is because it's three weeks of treatment. So we want people to actually get the whole treatment before they, before they deliver, because um, otherwise it would be hard to test it. But basically, other than that, you don't, there, there aren't, you know, there are a couple of contraindications to TDCS, for example, if you have a metal implant in your brain, or if you're taking too much of a medication, like a um, like a benzodiazepine or a mood stabilizer that would actually prevent you from getting the, from it being able to stimulate you, but really very few um, contraindications. And so um, we have two sites. We have Women's College Hospital for people who want to come downtown, and we have a Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center um, for people who it's closer for them uptown. But we have a whole bunch of other um, hospitals where we recruit. Um, like North York General, Unity Health, um, CAMH, Mount Sinai. And so we sort of divide it up to whatever's most convenient um, for, the, for the people. And, you know, as, as we keep recruiting, uh, you know, Hamilton, maybe you need to come on board so we can get this done faster. Um, you know, I was thinking, you know, there's like 300 people in this room. We need about 100 more people. So if each of you could get into a pod of three and find us a participant, that would be awesome. <laughs> Um, but, you know, here's our QR code if you're, if you're interested or, you know, or, or you want to see shameless promotion. This is what happens when you invite me. Um, you know, but I, I hope that this snippet today was, was interesting. I was hoping, you know, since we're talking about research and mental health research and how you would get research kind of from bench to bedside, I thought that this was a, a neat example because there's, there's probably no way if we had to get pregnant people to come in like every single day for 15 days, like there, there's no way. I mean, the people in our pilot study were awesome, right? Um, but now that we've got the at home, people are like really thrilled to do this. So, you know, I, I really do believe that this decision around antidepressants, it's not gonna go away. There's not more research that we're gonna do to make it less complex. So we need to find other accessible and acceptable treatments uh, to fill that hole. So. Let's everything we've heard today already on, you know, all of the research and that we'll hear to come, let's just continue to innovate until we can do what I think, I don't know if this is the exact wording, Patricia, of your goal, but, you know, provide all pregnant people with depression, the most safe and effective treatments uh, for them and their children. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vigo. That was that was fascinating. So interesting. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions and we have time for one question only. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you so much, Simone, for that very enlightening conversation. Very powerful, especially when we're talking about pregnancy and depression. Um, my question is about access, mental health access and the topic of gatekeepers. How accessible is, what did we call that? TD, TDCS. sorry? TDCS. Exactly. Yeah. How accessible is TDCS? Is it being talked about when we have the first conversation with the psychiatrist? And regarding the structural approach, especially in Toronto, we have a four year wait list for people who are waiting to see the psychiatrist. We have a four year wait list. The psychiatrists do not do a follow up, okay? Because of universal healthcare, we're passed on to the gynecologist or the OBGYN to follow up. And so how accessible is this treatment? Do we have people talking about it? That's number one. Number two, amongst, from an intersectional approach now, you would have people on the higher ladder of wealth status and access to quality mental health having conversations like this. And as a mental health expert, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. So thank you so much for enlightening me. But um, I'm talking about uh, black women. I'm talking about people with very low socioeconomic status. So how are we trying to mitigate this gap? Thank you very much. 
That is such a brilliant question and, you know, so much to unpack there because I think what I would say even before answering that question is that we know that there are groups who have a disproportionately lower uh, access to care for many, many reasons, including the ones you named, as well as medical mistrust, right? Concerns about racism in, in medical care, right? Like these are huge, huge issues. Um, TDCS specifically, and part of the reason that we chose it rather than another kind of more complex um, neurostimulation intervention is because it can be done at home. It's actually a Health Canada approved uh, treatment already. Um, and the device that um, if it were to be bought, it costs about $300. So you can imagine that like a midwifery practice could buy 10 devices, right? Like you could imagine how, um, if this is actually effective, and that's why we have to do the clinical trials, right? Like that's why it's not being offered as the first line of care, because we have to first make sure that it actually is better than placebo. But that's that's actually why we did it that way. And through the consultations that we did, um, because we, it, you know, or you could come into my office or your family, like it's, it's a really accessible, easy to use treatment. So, you know, sometimes we talk about, okay, like maybe that might not be the treatment, maybe that's not the first line treatment, but like you were saying, like, gosh, what if somebody's waiting for psychotherapy or what, if, right? Like it's a self, self-managed, um, you know, not very costly treatment would be really quite huge to add to our arsenal. You touched on, and I know I only have a minute, but like you touched on sort of the concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion, like in in general in care, but also in research trials, right? And so we have been we've been working um, with our partners, and we've been working kind of at the front line of the like we we recruit from referrals to our specialty clinic, um, where by the way, like our 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 wait list um, for first consultation with the psychiatrist is about four weeks um, for pregnant postpartum because it's so urgent at that time. But we've been actually recruiting a lot straight from like um, midwifery obstetrical settings right and then you know we bring them into our program and we follow them also but we've been really working with partners around that and we actually just looked for our first 45 participants we actually just looked at the um the diversity um and what we found in our first 45 participants is actually um seven percent are indigenous um 14 and and a half percent are black um and then just under 50% are Asian or South Asian. So not, not like not perfect. And, you know, we continue to see, but, and I think you're right that, you know, in clinical trials, like you tend to get people who are maybe more trusting of the medical system in general. And, and you're right in terms of like, you know, people who kind of have, have maybe have experience with research in other settings because they went to school and they, you know, did research. So that's actually a big problem with clinical trials. Um, in general is are we getting the people in our clinical trials who we are going to actually be delivering this to? And a lot of people, this is my last comment on this, talk about like you want to do the efficacy trial, like to see mechanistically does it work, but then you actually really should be doing effectiveness or some people call them like implementation trials to see like, is it how well is this going to happen in the real world and what adaptations are we going to need to make um, in order to make that happen, which actually is a really great segue to Dr. Singla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. I'm sure we're all eagerly going to be awaiting the results of that RCT. Fascinating. Um, up next is Dr. Daisy Singla. Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto, Women Mind Senior Scientist at CAMH. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for that wonderful lunch. I'm surprised that I'm still standing up here. But in any case, um, I have the privilege of serving as your first, uh, hopefully not last, Women Mind Scientist. And I'm delighted. Oh, thank you. Um, and I'm delighted to talk about what many of the presentations have talked about today with respect to access. I've devoted my career 
to the business of access and not so much the business, but to the patients who are in deserve of accessible and effective treatments. So I'm going to be talking about psychological treatment specifically, and I'm just going to check in with regards to time. Do I still have the full amount of time? Okay, great. <laughs> so as we heard earlier, um, perinatal depression and anxiety affects one in five women. Um, this stat is staggering, and as we heard from Patricia, that brilliant um, presentation earlier today, this is this may just be an underestimate. What I've focused on is psycholog brief psychological treatments, which have any of you heard of cognitive behavioral therapy? Hands up. Behavioral activation, Q, that's the B in CBT, interpersonal therapy. Okay, so these are all examples of brief evidence-based psychotherapies. And I've also had the privilege of working worldwide um, in some of the most low resource settings in the world. So it's one thing to work in the cities. Um, it's another thing to work in very, very rural places across Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And a lot of the lessons learned are from those settings and I'll be sharing some of those today. Regardless of whether we're sitting in rural Uganda or whether we're sitting in Canada, access to brief psychotherapies is abysmal. Uh, one in 20 individuals have access to minimally adequate treatments. This includes medications on this particular slide. And one in, in look, sorry, in low middle income countries, one in 20 individuals, 5% of individuals have access to minimally adequate treatments. In high income countries where, such as Canada and the US, we're not actually doing all that better. And this is despite the robust evidence behind the brief psychotherapies that we just discussed. There are many barriers. Um, and as Dr. Vigo just mentioned, um, the wide majority of, of perinatal populations would prefer um, these brief psychotherapies over medications. And there are many, many barriers as our colleagues have discussed today. Everything from cost to navigating the healthcare system to access to specialist care, and for perinatal populations in particular, um, the challenge of arranging transportation and childcare. So one of the solutions that many groups around the world have studied is the notion of task sharing, which is essentially distributing the task of uh, delivering psychotherapies to someone without a mental health background. Now, this is not new. This has been something that's been implemented since the 1970s, maybe 60s, um, and has been implemented worldwide and has really taken a blaze in um, much, of the, much of the global South. And what I'm referring to is essentially non-specialist providers or frontline healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers. So this could include a health volunteer, peers, community healthcare workers, teachers, nurses, midwives, the list goes on and on. Now, in low and middle income countries, um, we did a review and we identified at the time, back in 2017, 27 randomized control trials of non-specialist delivered psycho psychological treatments. That's a mouthful. And what you wanna basically pay attention to is who were the non-specialist providers in these low and middle income country settings. Typically, they were community health workers, peers from the same community, nurses, they're often female, um, and with relatively um, low education levels of primary education. However, even if we can train non-specialist providers to deliver psychological treatments, we also know that there is a vital role for specialist providers. And that includes the role of supervising non-specialist providers to deliver these treatments, ensuring safety, um, often referring, often as a referral pathway, um, and evaluating the treatments themselves. With respect to where these treatments are typically delivered, um, really, in a nutshell, it's where it was most convenient for patients to go. And I think that's really, really important. I mean, this is a lesson learned that from, from global mental health, but this is a really important lesson for all of us in terms of making treatments accessible, as one of our colleagues had mentioned earlier. 
The question that I used to get was how effective are non-specialist delivered psychological treatments? And surprisingly, um, if you can see the red, um, the red circle there, we see moderate to large effect sizes, which is quite remarkable. Um, actually, if you look at specialist delivered psychological treatments, the effect sizes are quite comparable. The other question that I get is, um, okay, that works over there, but what about here at home? And so we set out to do another review to examine non-specialist delivered psychological treatments in high-income countries uh, amongst perinatal populations specifically. And again, we found medium to, we found medium effect sizes of these treatments, particularly for depression and anxiety symptoms. And in general, when we asked the questions of who, where, what, how, and why, we found that it was typically nurses and midwives who were selected, um, self-selected, to uh, be trained and deliver these brief psychotherapies. They're often um, in primary care settings and often delivered face-to-face. -face. Now, mind you, this was 2021, and the search was based on 2020, pre-COVID, and so the results have, have, have changed a bit probably since then. The other innovative solution, in addition to task sharing, is telemedicine. Now, this might seem like old news for your, all of you, um, especially uh, since the pandemic, but this is really, really important for our perinatal populations. And we know that perinatal populations prefer um, telemedicine delivered psychotherapies for all of the barriers, for all of the reasons that I mentioned before with respect to barriers, particularly when it comes to mental health care. Unfortunately, to date, most of these studies on telemedicine have been relatively small, um, lacking the necessary power or sample size to really make some strong conclusions. And so I thought to myself uh, back in 2017 when I first joined um, University of Toronto and at that time Mount Sinai Hospital, I wondered if we could deliver these brief, robustly effective talk therapies that were clearly effective in low and middle low and middle income countries in our high income country settings here. And I wondered whether we could deliver them in the most patient centered way possible, including from a culturally sensitive lens and deliver them in a way that they were accessible. And so with the help of many in this room, um, we received funding from the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, which stands for PCORI, to launch the summit trial. And the summit trial um, is, well, I'll go into it in a moment. So the summit trial is um, 1,230 patients. And we are really asking two key questions. And that is, is a brief psychotherapy delivered through telemedicine as effective or non-inferior to in-person psychotherapy? So really getting at the how. And can non-specialist providers, in this case, nurses, midwives, and doulas, deliver this brief psychotherapy as effectively as specialist providers like myself, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, um, like psychiatrists, um, such as Dr. Bigot, um, and other specialist providers, including social workers. This study has been implemented in three hubs in Toronto, Chapel Hill, and Chicago. Um, the host institution is Mount Sinai Hospital, and I've had the pleasure of working with my good friend, um, Simone, um, who's a key site at Women's College. These are the site PIs, and we talk about interdisciplinary research, but our trial is really a testament to this. So as I mentioned, I myself am a clinical psychologist and global mental health researcher. Samantha Meltzer Brody is a perinatal psychiatrist from, and she's the co-PI of this study from uh, University of North Carolina. Rich Silver is an obstetrician and he leads the site at North Shore. Um, we all know Dr. Vigo, who um, is a perinatal psychiatrist and, and wears many, many hats. And Cindy Lee Dennis is actually a nurse by training and epidemiologist. But what's even more important than the lovely photos that you saw and the people that you saw on the screen is that this is an extremely diverse team. And I was so heartened to hear the perspectives earlier this morning of um, our patient advocates and um, how important it is to collaborate. Now, PCORI is like any trial that you would do in global mental health. 
um, is a funder like any trial that you would do in global mental health, which is there is the expectation to work very, very closely with stakeholder partners. We would not be able to do this research without our stakeholder partners. And so in addition to the many researchers who are on the team, really at the heart of this are our individuals with lived experience and our patient stakeholders to really steer us straight with respect to the development, implementation, and dissemination of our results. The treatment, and I'll speak a little bit quickly now, um, the treatment is an eight session behavioral activation treatment. And as someone asked me earlier today, why did we select behavioral activation? We know that there are so many effective interventions out there. And really there's three reasons. The first is that there's a robust evidence base um, and be behavioral activation is as effective as longer courses of treatment, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, and also has been shown to be as effective as, as medications for um, mild to moderate depressive symptoms. It's been effective for our target population of perinatal individuals, and it is easy to learn. Uh, individuals all over the world, non-specialist providers have been trained in um, behavioral activation. And for those of you who are interested, our manual is open access and anyone can download the manual for free on the Summit website, which is www.thesummittrial.com. So it's been a whirlwind, and um, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but simply to say that we have completed recruitment. We completed recruitment back in October. We actually um, have completed all of our primary data follow-up points, follow points um, as of the end of February. And um, while I'm under embargo, I will be showing some preliminary results to all of you um, to get a sense of, of how this trial has been implemented. I've been blessed to work with excellent partners, as, as I've emphasized, and we were really, really happy to achieve this goal because this goal means that this is amongst the largest psychotherapy trial in the world, and it focuses on pregnant and postpartum women. That's really, really important. That's really important, as we heard today, this is typically a negle neglected group uh, when it comes to accessing therapy. Now, to the question that came earlier, um, and I would agree with everything Dr. Vigo said with respect to access, that 50% of our participants identified as BIPOC. Now, that is remarkable in any trial, but is particularly remarkable in psychotherapy trials, which tend not to offer these treatments for culturally diverse individuals. Um, and one of the ways that we did this, in, in, in addition to referring to our hospital partners, was to also rely on our community partners. So we worked with organizations such as Life with a Baby, which is led by Claire Kurzoplin, and other organizations to really get the word out there and to be able to offer the treatment beyond our, our hospital settings. Um, what's been reassuring is that we're also seeing high high client satisfaction rates, and high retention rates of up to 90%. Now, the exciting part, and you guys are amongst the first to see this slide, um, but here are some of the scores uh, that we, here are the scores in, in the study. So what the 15.77 on the EPDS represents, for those of you who might not be familiar with the scale, is essentially a moderate, um, a moderate uh, score even though we allowed individuals who were as low as a 10 to enter, we actually received um, participants who had a much higher average. And you can see that the downward curve is a good thing because it means people are getting better. Um, they're getting better to the point um, that on average, individuals reported minimal symptoms. When we looked at anxiety, we saw a very similar trend. And um, this is extremely reassuring as well. As we move, again, from moderate levels of anxiety at baseline to, um, to sub-threshold symptoms at, um, at three months post-randomization, individuals received up to eight sessions, and most people, the wide majority of our participants, received eight sessions or more. So what are the next steps? Um, we will continue with follow-up assessments. We and some of the follow-up assessments, in addition to long-term outcomes of, or sustained outcomes at 12 months post-randomization, include child, uh, child outcomes or child development. 
we know that uh, receiving treatment, receiving effective mental health care has an impact on the child, can have an impact on the child, a positive impact. And we want to look at whether receiving that treatment antenatally might have a positive impact compared to receiving those treatments postnatally. And that's what we're doing at the, during the home visits. We have trained research assistants who are conducting um, the gold standard Bailey uh, to assess child uh, cognitive and language development. Uh, we just finished our testimonials and I'll show you one example of a testimonial in just a moment. We received separate funding to conduct a cost evaluation because um, the question that I get from the few fault policymakers that I've spoken to is how much is this going to cost? Or, and more importantly, how much are we going to save by offering these treatments via um, through task sharing and through telemedicine? And we're still in the process of involving policymakers because we're really, really excited to potentially be able to share the results once they're published in the fall. So stay tuned for more. Um, but I think what you all, who you all would really like to hear from are participants themselves. So hopefully this will work. No sound. I was gonna say if I could just put it down and stuff. Can I start again? How do I start again? I went through a shock, like for a week after delivering the baby. Your mood is alternating. You're crying at the drop of the hat for weird things. It wasn't as if I could just put it down and step away. Like my my kids eat me. But just uh, constantly feeling afraid. Talk therapy is the most effective intervention in mental health care, and we know that pregnant and postpartum women by far prefer talk therapies over medications. Behavioral activation is a type of therapy that uses brief, targeted behavioral interventions to help people feel and do better. One of the uh, design elements of Summit that really is unique is training individuals to provide mental health services who are not mental health specialists. From a first-hand lived experience perspective of actually speaking to hundreds at this point, there has been a profound impact of such a short, structured therapy on the lives of perinatal individuals. If they didn't have access to Summit, they might not have had access at all. Having someone to, to talk to regularly, just about my daily life and the things that I was trying to manage um, was incredibly invaluable. I do think it made an improvement to our family relationships. Um, it helped me to have more positive moments with my daughter. Having a nurse as a provider, there were what you could call good bedside manners. She met me where I was in terms of what I needed through like the empathy and, and being able to like feel through things with me. I did feel my mental health improve. My, I remember my husband mentioning it that he noticed too. Perinatal mental health care is so vital to individuals because it is the most common complication of pregnancy. There is no health without mental health. I think that's vitally important, no matter who you are. I think it's even more important for the perinatal population for the simple fact that they are caring for the next generation at an extraordinarily vulnerable, formative stage of life. And we know that parenting practices in this very critical period of time can impact that child's mental health throughout their life. This is very important. We are creating the human beings of the future, and I would like my child to have the tools to survive. We should all be super excited about Summit because this is something that we will be able to provide for so many people, reducing barriers, decreasing stigma, and really wrapping around families before mental health issues become problematic. So this allows us to have a population health approach to identifying and treating perinatal women and providing a first line treatment in. And that I think can be done most effectively by scaling up and using non-specialists. We don't need more randomized control trials to demonstrate whether a nurse, a midwife, a doula can deliver these treatments. They can. I hope that summit can influence decision makers, policy makers, healthcare administrators, to see the potential and actually implement the solutions from the science that we have been studying. We need to do better as a society, as researchers, as clinicians to improve access for these 
very common conditions. And I know we can do better because we've implemented some of it. Um, before I end, there are a bunch of my colleagues in the room. So for any of you who are involved with Summit, Patricia, Simone, but also my incredible team, not all of you could be in the room, but if you could just stand up um, and be acknowledged. Thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Dr. Singla. That was fascinating. And congratulations on the results. I can't wait to see this being implemented. Thank you so much. Any questions? We have time for one question. You've answered everyone's questions. No one has any questions. I mean, we just need to implement it, right? Okay, here we go. That was very powerful, um, and it just makes me think about the poor woman who took her life, and if there was something like that for her, it would have been amazing. Um, it also makes me think about this model, how it could be used so much more broadly in mental health. Um, I'm wondering if you could touch on that or if that's ever come up. Broadly as in beyond perinatal? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, task sharing and telemedicine delivered treatments are not new or unique to perinatal populations, um, but we've worked, we and many other groups have worked with youth, have worked with individuals who are not in the perinatal period, have worked with um, individuals of trauma, or survivors of trauma. Um, so it's not at, by, by any means uh, limited to perinatal. The advantage of focusing on perinatal, I think it's been highlighted by my colleagues, um, Patricia and, and um, Simone, um, for all the reasons. I think you know so often as, as researchers and as clinicians, we'd like to offer preventive treatments. And I think this is one way we can be preventive in our approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Singla. Thank you. Okay, up next is Dr. Kathleen Morrison, Assistant Professor of Behavioral Neuroscience at West Virginia University. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Okay, it's a wide room. How is everyone this afternoon? Good? Yes. Okay. I'm full of gratitude for so many reasons to be invited here, for the organizers, for all of you for these wonderful conversations. And I hope you will join me on this slight left turn into talking about animal models today. Uh, after these really impactful uh, presentations that I've enjoyed so much. Um, so uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest. So I want to take you back in time with me to not that long ago, but not not that long ago to when I was a trainee. Um, and I was studying the neurobiology of stress. So how stress changes your brain and um, what impacts that has throughout the lifespan. Um, and as I was doing that, all of the papers I was reading and all of the studies I was doing were in males. <laughs> and I started to kind of ask people in the field, why not females? Why aren't we studying females? What's going on with this female thing? And these were things that I heard. Females are too complicated. You're in for a world of pain if you study females, literal quote. Um, and it's too expensive to study females, right? Uh, I did not like these answers, uh, especially as I was looking at graphs like these, right? So we've heard a lot of prevalence data today, and this is just another way to show that across the world, um, there is a higher prevalence of here, the example here is anxiety uh, in women than in men. And yet every animal model, every paper that I was writing was starting with, we're trying to understand mood disorder, depression, and anxiety. And then here's a bunch of studies uh, that don't represent a population in which that's highly prevalent. Um, so 
as uh, I got on in my training, I was lucky to then uh, find a postdoc position where I could get into this and understand risk in females. Um, so one of the things we heard earlier today uh, was that girls are at risk during puberty. So puberty is a time of risk for females. Um, the study that uh, I'm going to talk about uh, was based on the adverse childhood experiences scale, which is one way to measure adversity uh, or trauma experienced in the lifespan. Um, so experiencing adverse childhood events during the time of puberty puts girls at higher risk for affective dysfunction later in life. And during this time period, they're at a higher risk for negative outcome than boys who tend to be more vulnerable to earlier life stressors, right? So that's one risk factor that we know about. But one of the other things that always bugged me was that we've, in the animal model, sometimes it's distilled things down. So we've re reduced them, reduced them so we can study complicated things. But humans are way more complicated than that, right? Uh, we have lots of experiences that accumulate through our lifespan. So another risk factor is becoming pregnant. Uh, and so one of the things that I uh, was tasked with as a postdoc and that now I've investigated in my own lab um, is the combination of these risk factors together. And so we started with just could we build this model um, that's relevant to female life experience? And I'm so glad that this question is becoming outdated, right? Like we're making so much progress that this seems such a weird question to ask, but at the time it wasn't. There were a few people, Lisa, uh, that were doing things like this right? <laughs> um, at, at the time. And so I'm gonna give you, show you kind of a little tour of the physiological, behavioral, and brain uh, outcomes that we've measured to show uh, that we can understand some of these things uh, and use mice uh, to help our understanding of things in humans. So what is this model? Um, I'm just gonna show you this, that everything I talk about today will be based on this. So we take mice and we expose them to chronic variable stress. Um, it's this very specific window, postnatal day 21 to 34. What is special about these days? Well, they haven't entered puberty yet at postnatal day 21, but they will all enter puberty by postnatal day 34. So we're capturing them in this time where all the, the changes associated with puberty starting are happening. Chronic variable stress in mice, we expose them to a variety of um, unpredictable uh, stressors, nothing painful, uh, but things like their lights on, their bedding is wet, um, unpleasant, unpredictable uh, stressors. And the work I'm gonna tell you about today is that all the outcomes we looked at in and around uh, pregnancy. And so I have data from nulliparous females, so ne never pregnant, late pregnancy, and then some postpartum work as well. And so the first thing we started with was the stress response. Um, so we've heard a little bit about the HPG axis today. So the HPA axis is highly related. So we have the hypothalamus, the paraventricular nucleus, uh, which releases corticotropin releasing factor to the pituitary, which releases adrenocorticotropin hormone to the cortex, which releases cortisol in humans uh, and corticosterone in mice. Um, importantly, during pregnancy, the placenta also releases CRF. And so we look there as well. So why look at this outcome in our humans and our mice? One, a disrupted HPA axis is an endophenotype across affective disorder, so we see this as a symptom across many different disorders. It is equivalent in humans and mice. It's fairly conserved. The molecules are highly similar. It functions the same way. It's not the same in young rodents as it is in adult rodents, so it's a system that's also undergoing change during this pubertal window where we're applying our stress. It's exceedingly easy to activate this axis in mice. You just pick up their cage, that will do it. Uh, we do it in a controlled way, often by putting them in a restraint tube so they can't move, but they're not in pain. Um, and that will cause an increase in glucocorticoid, so corticosterone over time. So I'll show you a few graphs that look like this today where we can look at this, this response, which is good. You should have a stress response. That's beneficial. It helps you respond to your environment. Um, it's when it's too high or too low, also bad, um, that you, we see um, associated with negative outcomes. So we just started with, can, do we see the same thing in humans as we do in mice? Is this a mouse model worth investigating further? Um, and so we started with the mice, so mice that were stressed during puberty. Now they're adults, we leave them alone and they either become pregnant or not. And these are their glucocorticoid responses to this stress. So uh, this is corticosterone over time, that gray bar there is when they're in the restraint tube. So this is the same animal's response over time. So they mount that typical response. And if they're not pregnant, we don't see an effect of our pubertal stress. We can't tell these animals apart. When they become pregnant, and that's gonna be a theme for this talk, now we see differences um, where our puberty stressed females now have this blunted HPA axis response to this stressor. So we were working with clinicians, a group of psychiatrists led by Neil Epperson, um, who were all at Penn at the time. Uh, and they were bringing in, they were recruiting women as part of this uh, center that we were working on. Uh, and they were actually at the time bringing in the babies to stress the babies, the offspring of moms with high adversity, uh, to look at their stress response. And I brought these data to a meeting because the mouse work can go faster than human work sometimes, right? Uh, and we were kind of discussing what this meant and 
one of the clinical coordinators. So if you're in a room with, this was so great because someone was just paying attention and then said something in a meeting and it changed a lot of what we were doing. Um, said, uh, I actually, um, when we stress the babies, the moms are just right next door. So they can't comfort the babies, but they can hear the babies are crying. Um, I can tell who the high adversity moms are because they just don't seem to respond. They don't get upset just effectively. They don't seem to get upset. And we said, can you please take saliva from the moms too during this task? And so they did. So we had low and high adversity moms. Um, and so we took several time points of saliva before and after this uh, maternal separation task with the babies in the other room being stressed. And we see the exact same thing we did in the mice, where high adversity moms have this blunted HPA axis response, so a lower cortisol response to this, this stressor, right? Um, now, I always get asked if this is good. Isn't it good? You're not as stressed. Well, you need glucocorticoids to respond to your environment, like your baby, perhaps in the next room who might need you. Um, to put in a little bit of context, these women did score higher on their Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. Um, so, you know, that gives it a little bit of context. Now we did the same thing outside of a restraint tube. Uh, we did it also postpartum in the mice. And so then I went back to the lab and I designed a uh, assay that was just the same as the humans. And we see the same thing there as well. <laughs> so now we had this model where adult female mice and humans uh, have the same kind of peripartum phenotype uh, as a result of pubertal adverse experience. So then I went on to start my own lab and I wanted to start by giving this a little more context, this blunted response. Is it good, is it not? And so we started to do some behavioral tasks. And the first thing we did was a classic pup retrieval. How do these mice moms respond to their pups? Um, if you've ever seen it, it's a very ritual. They're very good under normal conditions. You take a pup out of the nest and they'll go and they'll bring it right back. Um, and they're usually very efficient at that task once they start to do it. And so I'm going to show you lots of pictures of highly talented undergraduates that started in my lab with me that, that completed a lot of this work. So in postnatal day three, we did this. And we saw a real disorganization of this behavior um, in females that had that chronic variable stress during puberty. They did more incomplete retrieval. So they pick up the pup, but they drop it. They don't make it all the way uh, to the nest. We see more rearing behavior. So a lot more uh, behavior that's not directed towards the pup. And they spent less time uh, in the nest during this task. Right? We also wanted to go beyond things that they do for their pups uh, and also things like anxiety, like behavior. So um, I had another set of students who um, looked at some non-pup directed behavior. Uh, so, so they did grooming, just uh, how much females groom when you put them in a novel cage. So that's just self-grooming as a measure of uh, kind of anxiety like behavior. And then uh, open field, which we heard about earlier today. So um, the first thing is that parity has a huge effect on many of the things we measured. So here we had nulliparous and then and, and first time primiparous female, so postpartum. Um, and just being Paris, so being in the postpartum window, uh, changes their behavior. This is maybe not a surprise, but some things that sometimes don't get measured, even though they're obvious. Um, and so there's just an increase in grooming behavior in general uh, postpartum, but the puberty stressed females groom more. Um, and then this is the one place where we found a difference between control and really stressed females that didn't require them to be pregnant, and it's on this open field test. But had we not tested them nulliparous, we would have never noticed that what parity does is actually makes them all a little bit more anxious, right? Um, so all the females are spending less time in the middle of the uh, open field there. All right. So we have a blunted HP axis response, disorganized maternal behavior, um, and enhanced anxiety-like behavior. And now because we're using mice, we want to get into the brain, right? That's the benefit of using these models. So I'm going to talk to you today about the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, although we've done some work in the preoptic area as well, which is what controls um, maternal behavior. But I'm going to talk to you about the stress response. So we really wanted to know why then. What's going on in the brain? What's changing in the brain? This is my like everlasting question. What is it? What is stress in your brain? Um, so we started in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus with some of that RNA sequencing we heard about this morning where we're measuring gene expression. Um, curiously, we found these six genes that are canonically only turned on when animals are stressed or when they're activated. We took these animals, we didn't do anything to them, and we took out their brains, um, and these genes were expressed, which was kind of a surprise. They shouldn't have been, but they suggested to us that perhaps what's going on in the brains of these females is they are having permissive gene expression. Their brains aren't handling the kind of physiological stress of pregnancy in a way uh, that is beneficial for them. 
So to ask whether or not that gene expression was being regulated properly, um, we looked at open chromatin, which again, I love when speakers before you kind of introduce everything. So we heard about open chromatin earlier, right? So the controlling of gene expression, um, and we performed attack sequencing to ask of these genes, so uh, we can look here um, and ask which genes are available for expression. And is the chromatin more open? Are they having the correct gene expression regulation? And so what I'll show you here is that we have both non-pregnant and pregnant females control and puberty stressed. And like many of the things we've seen, they're not that different when they're not pregnant. We don't detect differences between these two types of female mice until they become pregnant. And then they have wildly different responses at the level of the epigenome, right? So all the way down to the level of the epigenome in their hypothalamus, we see that they respond differently to pregnancy. Um, and so the puberty stressed females, like we predicted, their chromatin becomes wild open, right? So permissive gene expression, which is again, much like a HPA axis that low might seem good, too much gene expression is not necessarily good, right? Your brain wants to control that. All right. So I have this wonderful undergraduate, Lakeland Luther, who's following up on this to then ask, so what is it that's making the gene expression open, the chromatin open? Um, and so much of what we, uh, the analysis that we did on the uh, TAC-seq data suggested that these regulators of the epigenome called um, histone acetyltransferase, or HATS, and histone deacetylase, or HDACs, um, might be regulated differently. So these are enzymes that open and close the genome. Um, and so we looked here at kind of the balance of how this was in their brains. Um, and what she found was that not only does the balance of HATS and HDAC, so these two regulators of whether the chromatin is open, does it change dynamically throughout the lifespan? So I'm showing you here four data points prior to pubertal stress, at the end of pubertal stress, in adulthood, pre-pregnancy, and then what happens during pregnancy. And what I want you to appreciate from this figure is that what happens to the relationship between controls and pubertal stress is that they switch during pregnancy. Again, they respond completely differently to that, to that experience of pregnancy um, uh, and just reverses the effect we've seen, which matches what we saw in terms of their open chromatin, right? Um, and so we're picking that up here as well. All right. So we have changes in physiology and behavior. We have these changes. We see similar changes um, in the preoptic area in terms of acetylation and all of these changes in the paraventricular nucleus. But what is it about pregnancy that uncovers this, right? We don't see this until they become pregnant. And long story short, there were several pieces of data that suggested it might be allopregnanolone. Now that might seem obvious now, but at the time, brexanolone and allopregnanolone was not out yet. That wasn't on the market. Um, <laughs> that was just starting going through trials. Um, and so we also performed various pharmacological approaches that suggested allopregnanolone might be the thing about pregnancy that's uncovering all of these um, negative outcomes we see in puberty stressed females. So if we block the synthesis of allopregnanolone in females and don't allow it to bind where it binds, which is this GABA-A receptor, uh, we reverse the effect, right? So if we don't let the allopregnanolone bind, uh, we can also block it from binding by blocking the binding site on the GABA-A receptor, we reverse the effect. And surprisingly, if we give it to males who have had pubertal stress and in which we've never seen an effect on anywhere before, you can generate a blunted HP axis, which suggests they're experiencing that programming in their brain, but then they never encounter anything later in their life to uncover it, which I, for study about females, I really hate that these data are very cool. I'm like, it's a male data. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> it's all good. Um, and so um, what we, the last thing I'll tell you about is trying to link then those changes uh, in gene expression to this allopregnanolone, right? So it's allopregnanolone binding and then changing the transcriptome and maybe that's what's responsible. And we can kind of put this mechanism together. And so I have this talented undergraduate who cannulated the PVN so we could put allopregnanolone directly into the PVN and that's what she did. And these are heat maps showing the expression of those six immediate early genes. Um, so for it by females, and we included males here to see how males would respond. And I hope the first thing just to appreciate from the heat maps is that the males don't respond as much either to pubertal stress or to the allopregnanolone into their PBN, um, which might be, is an interesting finding. And so for three of these immediate early genes, we again looked at our vehicles. So these are females that are not pregnant, but were um, either exposed to pubertal stress here in the orange or not. And we don't see a difference bef before we give them allopregnanolone, which is our proxy for pregnancy here, right? 
But when we give them allopregnanolone, now we recapitulate that difference we've seen before. And what's interesting is that it, again, looks like the controls and the puberty stressed females are just responding to this in opposite directions. And now we see a difference between the groups, which suggests that it is the allopregnanolone changing the transcriptome. And now the next step is, of course, to link it out to the behavior, which people are furiously doing in the lab. So we have this model where we have stress during puberty that when we add on this unique state of pregnancy, shows us that there's altered epigenome, right? Altered chromatin, altered transcription, and alterations in physiology and behavior. Um, we think it's allopregnanolone that's the key there, um, although we haven't ruled out other hormonal changes. This is certainly, um, we have some strong evidence. And we continue to work on this because it's translationally relevant. Um, I'm thrilled to try to make any contribution to women's health, right, with this model. And so it's important to us that, and it's why I'm glad to be here to like keep this work grounded in the truth of what's happening in humans, right? Um, but it does allow us to investigate multiple levels of biology. And so this is kind of the philosophy my lab has about um, gaining insight from animal models, right? To communicate and collaborate with clinicians, um, who I'm always so grateful will talk to uh, the mouse people about things, um, to measure highly translatable outcomes uh, to increase the complexity of our models for across the lifespan and these different things, and to take this interdisciplinary approach that we've tried to take. So with that, I will thank everyone who's done the hard work, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, thank God for smart people. I just, I don't know what to say. That was someone much more advanced than me could have made a much better comment on, on your presentation, but it was amazing. And thank you for the mice. <laughs> um, questions? Two, two questions. Ooh, you're lucky. Two questions. Oh, yeah. Thank you for a great talk. So I saw AGR1, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so we have to talk and about and it. really, like our study show for the first time, that AGR1 is yep. an opponent of chromatin. So now you also have, you don't need to look at the HDAX and the hat. Yeah, you can look at AGR1. It's Thanks amazing. It's all. Yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that we showed that it's an opener, but it's sex specific opener, right? right? And what I also like, you see after allopregnolone increase in the expression with increase in expression with the estrogen, right? So right. there is this hormonally regulatory thing. That's, that's perfect. I did want to, I, I, I read your paper in neuropsychopharmacology, but I forgot. But can you just tell me, there should be also a lot of differences between just non-pregnant and pregnant mice in terms oh, of chromatin yeah. opening and stuff. Sure. But, we didn't focus on that, but there are definitely differences. There are yeah. just different differences between them. But, <laughs> but you don't think you could find something there that was showing where vulnerability is coming from, mm. right? Something that would be just telling you, okay, what is this that actually changes the well i mean that's how we got to the h decks right so we did the transcription factor motif analysis uh -huh. which suggested a family of regulators that both and it wasn't super helpful because it was like they bring hats and h decks to yeah. the epigenome so that's why we started there okay. and we actually started with some specific histone marks mm -hmm. that didn't it didn't pan out so we went kind of to the to the next level mm -hmm. so but that's why we got to the to the acetylation mm -hmm. as the first no no but it's great like a lot of potential there are like you know a lot to enjoy yeah. thanks so much <laughs> i know i know yeah, I have a mic. Hi, uh, Inger. I think we Hi, met Inger. yesterday. Yeah. So my question is, uh, allopregnanolone binds to an ion channel. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not really something that, that targets the DNA or the protein synthesis. Do you, is there something that we don't know about allopregnanolone yet? Or do you see what, what is happening downstream? It's a great question. The Thank entire you. dissertation of my graduate student that she's planning to do. No, so the, I mean, we've had the outside theory that allopregnanolone is turning back into progesterone when we put, you know, like, where is it binding? I agree with you. It's, it, do, it does not make for the easiest um, mechanistic flow chart to say it binds to an ion channel and now the chromatin is changing. You're totally right. Um, it could be that it's binding to other places. So it binds to other receptors as well. So it could be at the levels during pregnancy, you know, that it's having some kind of off target effects. Um, but that's as good of an answer I have, other than like I share it that question with you and we're we're getting into it for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. Our uh, last speaker for this session is Dr. Crystal Clark, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Chicago at uh, one of our summit meetings with uh, Dr. Singla and have the uh, had the continuing pleasure of seeing her at many different conferences and talks. I'm very excited for her talk. 
Uh, Dr. Clark is the Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto, Associate Head of Research at Women's College Hospital, and Scientist at Women's College Hospital Research Institute. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Those are some powerful talks to come behind. My talk will be a little bit different. I'll be coming back to access. And I will also be not presenting a lot of data today. Today is about presenting and planting a seed, a seed that I hope brings a lot of dialogue that will hopefully lead to action. So you'll, you'll learn why as I talk about this. But my topic today is Black perinatal mental health, disparities, social determinants, and achieving equity in Canada. I will say that I must, I must share that I bring a different context to this land, coming from, for those of you who don't know me, coming from the United States, now working and living in Canada. I have an interesting perspective, I think, a unique perspective. So you've heard from my colleagues earlier, and it sounds like throughout the day, um, about the, the really staggering rates of perinatal mental illness. You know, 20%, it's pretty high. It's a public health problem. Nothing new there. And in Canada, Canada's no different. One in, about one in four actually, 23% uh, dealing with uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders during pregnancy and postpartum. And this, this is data from 2019. We know that in the pandemic, numbers got as high as one out of two. I mean, 50%, that's pretty staggering. Um, th and this really brings together the, the range um, from looking at the lowest numbers of 16% and Saskatchewan, I don't know how to get that name right, uh, to 31% in Nova Scotia. We have also heard about how untreated or undertreated mental illness can lead to poor obstetrical outcomes, as well as poor uh, health outcomes for the fetus and the, the born, uh, the infants. We know that some of those outcomes can be quite significant. So we're talking about preterm birth, uh, low birth weight babies. These are the things that put the baby at risk for mortality, actually. Uh, gestational hypertension, um, antepartum and postpartum hemorrhage, something we don't talk about enough. And risky behavioral changes. So when you have someone who is not at their best and they're dealing with a mental illness, they might not go get that prenatal care that they need or, or even know they have gestational hypertension. They might self-medicate with substances. They might take uh, risky behaviors that they otherwise would not, and that puts the, the pregnancy in jeopardy, as well as the fetus. We know that postpartum, that attachment or bonding that should be happening may not happen in a way that is healthy to the infant, such that they grow up with social and emotional deficits. We also know that there are significant disparities in, in all marginalized populations but specifically that exist in perinatal mental health for black women. And that's what I'll be talking about more today. So you've heard from my colleagues about, um, which I, I think their work is amazing, and both of them are very good at being uh, inclusive. But as I, as I stand in this land, and as I've done this work in the US, I know that inclusive does not meet equal access as one of the women asked. And that's something we have to work on. Now, I've already told you that poor obstetrical outcomes and infant outcomes are linked to mental illness, especially in those who are of African ancestry. Black maternal mortality in the US and in the UK from 2020 and 2021 showed that in the US it was double the rate of, uh, in black women compared to their white counterparts, four times the rate in the UK in the black women compared to their white counterparts. That's, and this is per 100,000 births. And when you think about it, the, it's not, you know, when we actually look at the births, for instance, in the US, it's 34 versus seven, um, for example. It's a little closer to triple the rate. But, you know, even though those numbers are small, that's pretty, pretty significant in a developed country. So we have to think about that. Black per per perinatal people are thought to have uh, depressive symptoms three times as much as their white counterparts. 
I emphasize depressive symptoms because this is a, a sticking point for me. Uh, in the US, we have kind of adopted this idea that it's triple the rate of peridotal depression um, in black women. And it could be, I have no idea, but I'm talking about depressive symptoms. The, the data actually does not show that we have actually ac assessed depression and enough black women to get the rate. So it's really about how many have screened positive or how many have um, had symptoms checked at all. But when we start thinking about the connection between depressive symptoms or mental illness and pregnancy outcomes, and we think about the mortality rate of black women, it's actually quite connected and it's very concerning. So we know that black women are dying at rates much higher um, in the US and in the UK compared to black, um, compared to white counterparts and anyone for that matter. They, are, they have the highest rates of mortality. But when we look at untreated mental illness and we think about the risk for preeclampsia and that being a common cause of mortality in black women, you, know, you start to wonder what's the connection. The same with placental abnormalities and postpartum hemorrhage, but also suicide. The UK did an interesting study showing that the highest rate of suicide was nine to 12 months postpartum. And when they looked at who had the highest rate of suicide, it was African-Americans, uh, not African-Americans, but those of African descent and those who were Hispanic. And when they looked at, when we looked at the US, when we looked at the CDC, 23% of African-American and Hispanic women commit suicide postpartum, again, the highest number. But what about untreated mental illness when we start thinking about infant outcomes and the rates of mortality of, of infants for Black women? They are also leading the charge in the most infant mortality. So two times the rate in the US um, of Black infant mortality in Black women, and this is per 1,000 births. So about 11 per 1,000 births compared to five per 1,000 births. Then low birth weight babies. This is a, another major risk factor for mortality. And again, we're looking at double the rate. So as I've mentioned, you know, preterm birth, low birth weight babies, increase the risk for mortality, but it also disrupts, cog when we think about depression and this perinatal period, it disrupts cognitive, emotional, and social development. Later mental health problems, as has been mentioned, social adjustment issues, and difficulties in school. And the problem is that this is disproportionately affecting this population, and we have to wonder why. Well, we have some ideas as to why. You know, we come back to race being a social construct and something that has been used for oppression and violence and has social, political, and legal implications and impacts health disparities, right? And I wouldn't bring this up necessarily. Um, you know, I will, I will say there's, I love the energy in Canada and the progressiveness and me coming up here at this particular time over the past year and a half, I've just been in awe of so much um, progressiveness around discussions around equity. And, but I get the question sometimes like, but do we, I mean, is that really that big of an issue here? And I would answer the question by saying, any place where race has been adopted as a social construct, which it has been here, is a place where you have to look for disparities and racism, you know, and how that impacts the community and those who are marginalized. So when we're thinking about that racial construct, we also have to not just look at race, which is a social determinant and structural determinant of health, but also think about social determinants of health. You know, I talk a lot, um, some of you have heard me say that, you know, black is not a homogeneous population, white is not a homogeneous population, Asian is not. Um, but for sometimes, sometimes it's treated that way, like, you know, it's just one group of people with all the same background. And it's not, we really have to think about how social determinants of health are impacting individuals in any background, but definitely in the black community. So social de determinants of health are factors that impact health outcomes, including where we work, that include where we work, live, play, grow, age, all the things. 
And according to Statistics Canada, this includes income and social status, neighborhood, where you go to school, um, healthy behaviors, access to health services, just to name a few. There are so many limitations in the research in Black maternal mental health, and particularly in Canada, because what's been happening? We haven't been collecting any racial demographics, or at least not universally in a way that we can actually address the gaps or characterize the disparities. And even on top of that, we've been citing poor research from other places you know, in developed countries like the US. So there's a lot of confounding of race and low socioeconomic status data. So you know, I see Statistics Canada saying, oh yeah, this is the rates and it's coming from the US and I'm looking at the US data like, well, that's bad data too. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so we need our own, and it's not equal data. You know, this is a very different place, different um, health care, uh, different makeup of the black community. So we really need our own data. There's also a lot of small sample sizes, and we know that with small sample sizes, there's a risk for overestimation or underestimation. So we really need more robust data, uh, which unfortunately hasn't happened in many cases. There's also a lack of assessment for social determinants of health. So back to that homogeneity of treating um, groups of people like they're monoliths, you know, not really addressing the, okay, well, what about, you know, higher educated, um, living in a, a nicer, safer neighborhood versus someone who's living in a very poor neighborhood that where they don't feel safe or things like that. And then looking at symptoms versus diagnosis, so important. So overall, the look, um, when we think about perinatal mental illness in black women and birthing people, there's also just a, a gap of data when we start thinking about anxiety. You know, we talk a lot about depression, but when we start to look at, well, how, how does this population uh, do and fare in terms of anxiety? Bipolar disorder, which is an area of uh, research for me and an area I've been passionate about all my career, I can tell you it wasn't until a couple years ago where the Center for Disease Control in the US actually had a stat on how many black people might have bipolar disorder and particularly how many women, okay, um, who are black. And that's pretty concerning, especially because of the history in which black women have this, been misdiagnosed with schizophrenia or other psychotic disorder, disorders who have bipolar disorder. Um, have some data coming out which suggests that there's about a 40% rate of bipolar disorder in the perinatal population in black women, but we need much more data to, to confirm that. Trauma is another area which thankfully is being more recognized as we continue to do research and, and, and how it impacts the perinatal period. And we know that trauma is disproportionate in black women. And postpartum psychosis, I could, there's nothing out there on black women in postpartum psychosis. And we know that that's a huge risk factor for infanticide and suicide. So these are major areas, major gaps. So what about the risk factors for black Canadian women and birthing persons? Well, I can tell you black doctors and white doctors, and I think many are saying we need more data here in Canada. Uh, we keep citing the UK, the US data, but there's nothing in Canada to talk about black maternal mortality or black maternal mental health. We know that according to the government of Canada, black Canadian women are disproportionately more likely to be unemployed or underemployed, live in housing below standards, experience severe food insecurity, and report fair or poor health. Now those are significant social determinants of health and how do we think that might impact the perinatal period. So today I, I really more so present to you a call to action. Um, there are so many things that we need to do to address and characterize the disparities and the gaps that we see as it relates to perinatal mental illness in black women and those who identify as black or of African ancestry. And 
only in doing so can we really truly develop strategic interventions and access to care in a more broad way. So one thing is characterizing the prevalence of perinatal mental illness and obstetrical birth outcomes in, in Canada. And one way in which, if you know, as Dr. McGill knows, um, we get this grant, we submitted a grant to look at the uh, provincial data, ICES data, uh, linking to data sets such as born, and be able to just begin to characterize, well, what's the prevalence? What's the outcomes? What, what do people present with? Um, where, who are, where are they going for care? How are they receiving care? What does it look, what does it look like? And what might we learn from that data to do further research and start to even build and, and develop strategic interventions? Um, understanding illness course, barriers to access, these are so important. And I will tell you why um, barriers to access are so important to me since I've been here, because I've been doing so much engagement with the community, which has been amazing. Um, but I, I will tell you, I came in very like, okay, I mean, what's the problem? <laughs> and, you know, the community was very much like, well, I can't get into the, to see a, uh, a psychiatrist and definitely not one that's a perinatal expert. And, you know, I don't know how to get care or they don't have a family doctor, so they can't get a referral. So there are so many layers to access that I have learned. So I, I think those are major issues. And then using our findings for advocacy and strategic interventions is gonna be so important. Before I close today, I'll just share that something that I have started to do um, at Women's College Hospital. And this is just starting to capture our own data. I said, well, you know, let's start at home, right? Why don't we look at who we are giving care to and who has access to us and, you know, how are they perceiving their care and how safe do they feel in, in terms of the care they're receiving? Do they come back, you know? Um, do they have good outcomes? We're very early in, in collecting this data. So this is a, a very, this is a sample of a sample. And I already told you guys about what small samples, what, what the risks are there. But this is uh, looking at data from those who had an EPDS screen of greater than or equal to 12, so a positive EPDS screen, and who had a new intake consultation in our reproductive life stages clinic. So we had 92 intakes, 50 or a total of 183 perinatal consultations, 92 had um, intakes, which means that they had data collected on demographics. So the whole point is that I've implemented this demographic um, flow sheet, which is new. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised it's new because I'm like, why aren't we why aren't we asking our patients in psychiatry about their, their backgrounds? But my colleagues now have been I've been encouraging them to do so. So all of the patients who um, got a flow sheet where they completed racial demographics, sexual orientation, other um, you know intersectionality identifiers. We had a total of ninety-two and fifteen percent of those, a total of fourteen patients were black. When we think about social determinants, most of them were employed. Almost eighty percent were Canadian citizens. 71% were pregnant. Most, uh, or at least majority had, uh, not majority, a good amount, I would say, completed high school and um, not too many completed college or higher education than that. And this is just preliminary data. We need so much more. I am continuing to ask my department to um, help me find ways in which we can just implement steady data collection and not so much as a research project, this is something we should be doing just in every encounter, understanding the patient who walks into the room. So understanding their background and documenting in the chart so that we can go back and see who we're serving and are we serving them well. So finally, I will just close with this. For those of you who are familiar with Don Lewis, I know my uh, American counterparts are, uh, Don Lewis is a, was a congressman. He died a couple of years ago, and he was a civil rights leader, marched with Martin Luther King. He was a congressman until he died, um, well into his late 80s, early 90s. And he was known for this, this quote, let's get in good trouble, necessary trouble. 
And I say, you know, let's make changes and let's not be scared of those changes and let's not be scared to push the conversation and let that conversation turn into action. I am here to get into good trouble and necessary trouble. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for that extremely, the vital work that you're doing in Black Maternal Mental Health in Canada and abroad. Thank you. Um, we have time for a question, if anybody has a question. Over here. Thank you for this insightful presentation. When it comes to data, do you think insurance carriers, insurance companies, need to collect race-based data so that employers know um, within their own population of employees um, that they're Black or they're South Asian or other types of demographic employees in terms of what chronic conditions they're experiencing. Because I feel like that's also a gap as well, that the insurance companies aren't collecting that data. And I was just curious uh, what your thoughts are on that. A great question. Um, I haven't thought about that in great detail. So that that's that's something I'll probably ponder on some more when I leave. But my first thought is that it's on us as um, providers and researchers to collect that data and then to inform the insurance company of what our needs should be or what our population needs should be. I would worry about putting the onus on them to collect that data because they're business folks and what they might want to do with that. Now, again, I don't know what OHIP might want to do with that or, or not, but again, any, anywhere where the racial construct starts to, it, you know, it starts to just kind of bleed into social, political, uh, and legal, legal issues, it definitely bleeds into business. And when we talk about the bottom line sometimes, so I would want to put that on, on the clinician to do that work first and then, you know, inform the insurance companies of what's needed. We have another question. We have time for. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Crystal, for this excellent, phenomenal presentation. Just touching base on your lovely question. I work in insurance and big no. Yeah. <laughs> that was my thought, but. <laughs> Until insurance companies are not about profit maximization, I don't think we're ready to collect that type of data. You know, working front lines and responding to clients and having them pull out their hair to get coverage for expensive psychedelic medications or for expensive medications, for example, Vivans, Concerta, which is very life altering for people with ADHD. I'm just talking about baseline medications. It's a big hassle. How much more insurance getting that data? So, but anyways, it's a bigger conversation. Um, again, to the presentation, I do have some thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a question, but I, I would love to get your opinion as well. Mm -hmm. Speaking on the issue of barriers to mental health, because that's something that lies at the core of my heart. I was just thinking about, is there a possibility of us decentralizing healthcare and not having it in the hands of institutions? For example, if we are talking about access to mental health and we're putting all these fantastic healthcare, fantastic services to doctors and midwives, how many people have a health card? How many black people are properly um, have proper immigration status to begin with? Mm -hmm. So there's a first line barrier. I know it's utopic, but I think it's such a great conversation. And my second question, because I want you to answer, there's this discussion we've had at the Mental Health Commission of Canada. I don't know if you're familiar with Step Care 2.0 mm -hmm. and you know, it would be lovely to have this one-stop shop where we walk in and we have all the services amalgamated. We have the follow-up, we have the continuous care, we have, and again, back to decentralization, can we have gatekeepers in schools, in temples, in churches? It might be very utopic. 
do we have to go first to you know the doctor again this is me in my facade probably but just thank you so much for a lovely presentation your thoughts well thank you for the question i'll make it brief because i know they want to get to the next talk but um i don't think you're off at all thank you for the question it's funny you mentioned that one-stop shop because I have dreamed of that one-stop shop since I became a doctor. Um, and some of it had to do with my my uh, conflict between whether or not I would be a surgeon, the ob guy, or psychiatrist. Uh, you know, I was like, can we just have everything in one place? But um, I definitely think it's so needed for mental health um, and particularly for women and childbearing persons but we should talk more about that. But back to your first question in terms of access and, and decentralizing it, absolutely. And I think that's why the work that Dr. Singla is doing is so amazing because that's exactly what should be happening. And when I talk to community organizations here, I say, yeah, the ivory tower should be a resource, but not your main source. You should be able to be doing these things in your community, in this midwifery group, in this doula group, in this, you know, psychology office, there, you know, in the OB clinic that are serving the communities. In all of these community programs, there's so many and they're so siloed. And yeah, many of them don't have family doctors that can refer them. Many of them are immigrants and undocumented. And that is why they're lacking access. And I think it's programs like Summit that can be scaled such that there's there can be access in the community by community providers. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Clark. Thank you to all the presenters for Spotlight on Perinatal.